Okay, for those of you that do read emails and pink toenails, uh, here, got to check out my socks. Yeah. So I have two granddaughters with bows and a grandson. The toenails. <laughs> Um, all right, welcome. This I think this is uh, maybe very well an attendance record, which is shocking because this piece of scripture is, um, we will not be verse by verse. Let me just say that today. Uh, I was going to challenge, have a challenge and, and ask if anyone had ever memorized any piece of scripture from Joshua 19 to 22. And if you haven't looked at that scripture, because I, we didn't send out all the verses, I challenge you to go do it, but we have, we happen to have a memory expert who rarely comes, who literally spoiled, spoiled it. She has memorized this piece of scripture. So how many, how many books of the Bible have you memorized? 33 books of the Bible, which is a sin. That's actually a sin. Total. You need to be out witnessing. <laughs> um, this is a hard, hard piece of scripture. It just is. Uh, but as you get into each piece of scripture, there are things that you can pull out, even from long list of Hebrew names that you don't fully understand. Uh, but you have to understand the context of Joshua, which is that they have entered the promised land, and it is a typos, which is Greek, of our salvation. And Joshua, Yehoshua, which means Yahweh is salvation, is the same name as Joshua, is the same name as Yeshua, which is Jesus. And this is a story of crossing over into salvation and then having to actually conquer what's been promised to you. And Israel never did it, never did it. And we'll see that they won't do it today, but there are people that are part of this that actually do claim their promised land. There were five young ladies that claimed the promised land. We saw Caleb last week claim the promised land. Now, we know that two and a half tribes prior to the time they crossed Jordan decide that they're going to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. And so the remaining tribes, eight and a half tribes, have to be apportioned. Their land has to be apportioned. It's by lot. And what happens is Joshua is apportioning. He starts out, as we saw last week with Judah. And then we had the beginning of Ephraim and Manasseh. And so we're going to pick up in the middle of Manasseh as we kick off. Then allotment was made to the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. Now Zelophad, the son of Hefner, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of the daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tizra. They approached Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the leaders and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. Thus there fell to Manasseh ten portions besides the land of Gilead and Bashan which is on the other side of the Jordan because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with his sons. The land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of the people of Manasseh and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, the third of Nephla. And yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to force labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Okay, in the introduction, I didn't mention, I may have mentioned that Judah was the first one that was apportioned, and it appears that these tribes are going in order of importance. And so we start with Judah, which was the Lion of Judah, where we know that David and Jesus' tribe were, mm -hmm. and then Joseph. Joseph received a double blessing. Let's go down to the chart. So these are the two censuses that we studied in Numbers. And you'll see down at the bottom, you'll see the two tribes of 
of Joseph. So what happened is that Joseph decided that he was going, to, Jacob decided he was going to give Joseph a double blessing. And so he blessed both of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they ended up becoming a tribe. And those are the 12 tribes where land is apportioned. There's a 13th tribe, uh, which is Levi, that didn't have any land apportioned. And if you look at the number of people in the second census, you'll see that there are 85,200 fighting men in blue down at the bottom. And that's the largest of any of the tribes, but it's very close to the number of Judah. And so they receive a double portion. We'll see the land in a minute. Now, as Jacob was getting ready to die, he, he had dim eyesight and Joseph brings his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Manasseh is the oldest. And Ephraim is there. And Jacob crosses his hands and puts his hands on their head. And he blesses Ephraim as if he was the oldest. And Joseph tries to correct him and tries to say, no, 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 this is Manasseh is the oldest. And Joseph was like, I know what I'm doing. You will, Manasseh will be a great nation as well. And so we'll see that as we come in. Now, Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, that's underused, right? Hefer. Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, and I love these daughters. You'll remember when we studied Numbers 27, I talked about how I wanted to have a granddaughter named Russellina Hogla, but <clears throat> that was vetoed. And so these five, I'm glad, glad Catherine is here because these five ladies, young ladies, so their father dies and they have no brothers. And in Numbers 27, they're laying out a system whereby the land is going to be apportioned within each of these tribes, and it's patriarchal, because what they wanted was the land to remain in the tribes, and so it was going to be given to the sons. And so these young ladies have no brothers, their father dies, and they stop up to the tent of meeting with Moses and Eleazar, and they're mad as a wet hen. And she said, you don't know that. And I'm like, I know women. I mean, I, it doesn't say that, but I know they stop up literally to Moses and the high priest. And they say, why should our father's name be erased? Because we have no brothers. Now give us our possession. And Moses says, okay, well, ho hold on. I, I don't know what to do with this. And he says, let me go inquire of God. Oh, if you're with if you're with a woman who's mad as a wet hen, always just go pray, get away from her. And so he goes and prays and he comes back and he says, they're right. Let's make sure that when we cross over, that they get their promised land. And the only condition was so that they would return the land within that tribe was that they marry someone within the tribe. And so these young ladies stomp up make the request, and then as they come into the promised land, they don't have it. Moses has passed away. Joshua is in charge. And they come up and they said, Moses promised us this. We want this now. And he said, you're right. And he gave them their inheritance. It's a perfect thing of claiming your promised land. And it's a perfect thing about women. The We, we look at the Old Testament, we look at all these things with submission and all of these things. These are five young ladies going to the head of state and to the high priest and feeling emboldened to actually ask for a promise. And we flash forward to Galatians and we hear Paul say, for in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female, meaning that all of us, male and female, have equal right to approach the throne of the grace of God, by the grace of God. And so even in the Old Testament, they had much more ability than any of the females in any of the countries. And you go to places like Yemen and places that I go to, and you, you see the human rights. Nothing has done more for women than Jesus Christ. And every Christian nation, nation Women have more rights in every Christian nation around the world than any other place. And so Christianity does not hamper women. And my wife is on equal footing with me in terms of our relationship. So they approach, they claim their promise, and 
they had to claim it first, by the way. They they were the promise had been given, but they had to go claim it as they came in. So let's go to verse five. And I want you to remember this as we get into the subsequent scriptures. Thus there fell to to Manasseh ten portions beside the land of Gilead and Basham. Gilead and Basham are on the east side. On the promised land side, in the land of Canaan, their promise, Manasseh, half of the tribe of Joseph, their promise, ten portions. Just remember that. And the inhabitants of Megiddo, remember that. And its villages, the third is Napta. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities because the Canaanites persisted dwelling in that land. And now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put out, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out. What that means is they had the choice. They had the choice to drive them out. They grew strong. They had made a commitment. God had given them a command. If we go to Judges 2, 1 through 3, this is the book right after Joshua. And now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. That's the angel of the Lord and God. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. That means... You don't make a covenant for forced labor. You don't, you don't do anything. Your job is to break down their altars, but you did not obey my voice. What is this you've done? So now I say to you, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides. Their gods shall be a snare to you. And that's what happened until the ultimate destruction of the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms fell into southern kingdom. <clears throat> the tribes fell into disarray as well. It's a real lesson that when we're saved and there are things that keep us away from God, we're supposed to kill it. We're supposed to break down the altars of the things that are in our way from God. Even if we're saved, there are things that can take us away. And the, and the analogy here is the thorn in your side you can't get out or a snare. And I've talked about the snares, the traps that, that we actually use on the ranch. A snare is something that a wild predator gets into. And as, as it struggles, it pulls tighter and tighter and tighter until it kills it. And it's saying that this, these gods and these sins to you Christians is going to be a snare. It'll pull tighter and tighter until you kill it. And so it's a great, great lesson. All right. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance? Although I am a numerous people since all along the Lord has blessed me. And Joshua said to them, if you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of, of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, but bo both those in Bethshean and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest border, borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. Okay. The people of Joseph are what two tribes? Ephraim and Manasseh. Both tribes, both tribes come up to Joshua and say, why have you given me but one lot? What did we just say Manasseh was promised? Ten. In verse five, it says ten lots fell to Manasseh. And they're saying, why do I only have one? And they come down and they say, since all along, the Lord has blessed me. I'm special. Why am I only, I 
I deserve way more than I'm getting here. Why am I only getting one? Let's go to the map. Hopefully everybody can see that. So you see Manasseh and you see Ephraim. Now look at the relative size of every bit of that compared to the other nations, including Judah. Look at Judah. Judah's huge, but they've got a big piece of Simeon carved out. And Manasseh on the eastern side is in the grassy lands. Manasseh and Ephraim on the left are in the most fertile grounds. They are enormous. And this is what was allotted to them. And they're saying, whoa, 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 I'm special. Why do I only have one lot? And Joshua said, if you're so special and you're so numerous, go claim your promised land. And then we come down to the end of verse 15, and we find out, go ground for yourself in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim. What are the Rephaim? Giants. There's giants. Verse 16, the people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us, yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron. And it's like, oh, wait, I'm blessed, so I want something where there's no struggles. I don't want giants and chariots of iron, but those in Bashin and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. So how does this compare to Caleb? Let's go down to Joshua 14.10. Remember Caleb from last week. Caleb was not of any of the 12 tribes. Caleb was promised an inheritance when he was faithful as a spy. So he Fought, he led, he was not part of Israel, but he had become a proselyte. He had be become a God follower. And God promised him when he came back, I'm going to give you land. And so when they cross over, as we learned last week, Caleb goes up to Joshua and says, and now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Just as he said, these 45 years since the time the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, this day I am 80 five years old and i am as strong today as i was in the day of moses sent me my strength now is my strength was then for going to war and for going and coming so now give me this hill country of which the lord spoke to me on that day for you heard on that day how the anakim what are the anakim giants were there with the great fortified cities it may be that the lord is with me and i will drive them out so caleb and the girls with pink toenails have claimed, they've claimed their possession, but the blessed ones, the spiritual ones, the special ones are afraid of the chariots and they're afraid of the Rephaim. Here's the other thing. Joseph, Joseph is of the tribe of Ephraim. These are his people. Joseph is, com they're coming to Joseph and they want something special. He's the leader of Ephraim. And he says, you are a numerous people. And you have great power. And you shall not have one allotment only. Now they said the valley of Jezreel. So there's chariots in the hill country that we're willing to fight. But in the valley of Jezreel, we're a little nervous because that's where the chariots are. Let's go to the pictures. The Valley of Jezreel is on the left, and in the Valley of Jezreel is the city of Megiddo. And you'll see in Revelation 16, 16, and they assembled them at the place that is in Hebrew called Armageddon. You've all heard of Armageddon, and that's Megiddo. Um, the word Armageddon is Har Megiddon, and that in our language is Megiddo, and that is the site of the final one of the final battles at Jesus' second coming, which we'll read about. And it is in the Valley of Jezreel. There have been 34 wars since the year 24 BC fought in the Valley of Jezreel, including Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon may have stood on the Mount Megiddo and looked out over this, and he is quoted as saying, all of the armies of the world could maneuver in this valley. So it's at this place Revelation 19 takes place. Let's go to Revelation 19. 
So Revelation 19, this is the, I, I tell this all the time, the conversation I had with Carolyn is about this battle. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is the second coming of Christ. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on it that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he calls himself is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and purple and pure were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule. So the armies of heaven are us. If you follow the correct end times interpretation, which is always mine, which is we are, we will be raptured and we will be in heaven. And after all of that time, when it's time to come down and fight the armies of the Antichrist in the, in the Valley of Jezreel, we're going to be pulling out our swords and we're going to be heading full speed with Jesus into that battle at this. And so there may have been something about this valley that scared them because there had been many, many wars already fought there, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, he says, let's go back up to the scripture in verse 17. At first, he acts like a father. And he says, if you're so blessed and if you're so numerous, then go take it, go do it. And they start complaining. And then he comes in like a mother. And he says to Joshua, he said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are numerous. You have great power. You're not going to only have one allotment. You're going to have everything that God promised, even though they have chariots of fire. Just go take it. You can do it. All right, next. Who's next? Okay. Okay. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. There, there remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joseph said to the people of Israel, how long will you put off going in to take possession of that land, which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Provide three men from each tribe, and I will send them out that they may set out and go up and down the land. They shall write a description of it with a view up to their inheritance and then come to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south and the house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. And I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inherit is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben and half of the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave them. So the men arose and went, and Joshua charged those who went to write the descriptions of the land, saying, Go up and down the land and write a description and return to me. I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed up and down in the land and wrote in a book a description of it by towns in seven divisions. Then they came to Joshua to the camp at Silo. And Joshua cast lots for them in Silo before the Lord. And there Joseph apportioned the land to the people of Israel to each his portion. Let's go to the uh, map. You can't see it there, but in Ephraim, up in the north, there is a town, there is Shiloh. And if you notice where Shiloh is, Shiloh is in the middle of Israel. So they have moved the tent of meeting from Gilgal, which is just across the Jordan, into Shiloh. And Shiloh means peaceful, it means anointed. And it is also a term that is frequently used for the Messiah, the anointed one, the peaceful one. At Shiloh, the tent of meeting stood for 369 years. And it was there that the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. It was there that they, they ceased to actually have a tent around it and they actually put in rock walls. 
Um, the tent of meeting uh, was in various places. It was in Gibeon, it was in Nob. Uh, it, we know that it was in Gilgal. It came back up here to Shiloh. And then eventually, when a king from the tribe of Judah came in, he decided that Jerusalem in Judah would be the place for the ultimate temple. And so King David moved that there. But while Joshua is in charge, he moves it to Ephraim. So let's go back up. Verse 18, one, then the whole congregation of the people of Israel. Oh, big point. Um, that is the presence of God. The tabernacle and the tent of meeting represents God with us, and they put it in the center, and it's actually a great lesson for us that the, that the presence of God should be in the center of our world. Everything that we do, we should have the presence of God right in the middle. And so they set up the meeting there, set up the tent of meeting there, and the land laid subdued before them. And for some reason, in verse 2, there remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not been apportioned. And it wasn't apportioned because they just forgot or they just weren't doing it. Because anybody know what a towel snap is? You know, when somebody needs to be disciplined, you go. So Moses, that's what the, this is a metaphorical towel snap. Pop, pop. So Moses in verse 3 says, how long will you put off going to take possession of the land and some of them are saying just as long as there's giants there as long as it's hard i'm not going to go do that and so joshua says that's not good enough i want you to take three men verse four from each tribe i'll send them out so that they can go up and down the land and they shall write a description this is like the first survey that has ever been recorded and you shall describe in verse six, the land in seven divisions and bring the description here and I will cast lots. And for those that weren't here, we talked about lots. Um, lots, we don't know exactly where they were, whether it was the Uman and Thuman in the high priest vestments. We don't know whether it was akin to dice or flat um, rocks or stones, but that's the way God, that's the way God communicated his will prior to the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, the last thing that happened with lots was the appointment of Matthias as the 12th replacement, the 12th disciple replacing Judas. So the Holy Spirit leads us now, not lots. But in the Old Testament, Psalms says the lot is cast in the lap, but it is the will of God that is determined. And so he is casting lots to pick out where these tribes are going to be. And the Levites will have no portion among you for the priesthood is of the Lord. We've covered that, but we'll come back to it again. And they came in verse nine to Joshua at the camp of Shiloh and Joshua cast lots for them. And there Joshua apportioned the land to the people of Israel in each portion. So let's go to Benjamin. Now you'll notice 11 through 28, there are no verses. So we're kind of verse by verse, and so if you want to, if you want to go read all that, read it. Um, but we have a deed that Jeff has put up there—a kind of a, an inheritance representing their land. And Benjamin, let's go to actually to the map and let's see where Benjamin is. So we'll see Benjamin. Can you see it there in blue? Benjamin, small little Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin was in Jacob's last blessing they call it blessings but they're curses and blessings when jacob is on his deathbed he said benjamin is a ravenous wolf and he devours his prey benjamin actually would end up being at cross purposes with judah much of their existence and the most prolific was when king saul a benjamite was trying to kill david we talked about that last week at in Gedi as King Saul's relieving himself and David is not wanting to kill him, but cuts off the corner of his robe in En Gedi. And so they're placed right there, kind of in a place of protection. That's the 12th son of Jacob. And so let's go to Simeon. 
the second lot came out for Simeon, for the tribe of the people of Simeon, according to their clans, and their inheritance was in the midst of the inheritance of the people of Judah. The inheritance of the people of Simeon formed part of the territory of the people of Judah because the portion of the people of Judah was too large for them. The people of Simeon obtained an inheritance in the midst of their inheritance. All right, let's go to the chart. So Simeon is cursed. Simeon is cursed. We'll, we'll cover that. Simeon and Levi were cursed. Anybody remember why they were cursed? Oh, we'll tell it again. Excellent. Do, did you, somebody want to come tell it? Nope. Out. All right. You'll see Simeon, second row in the second census after they're cursed. They're the smallest tribe, 22,000. Now let's go down to the map. And you'll see that rather than they have, they don't have any borders. They're right in the middle of Judah. Simeon and Levi were cursed because long, long, long ago, um, Jacob's daughter, Dinah, was raped by the Shechemites, by a guy named Shechem. And they he decided that he wanted to marry Dinah. And so these two guys primarily said, okay, well, if you'll be circumcised, then that's great. So while the Shechemites are circumcised so that they can win Dinah over to be part of their tribe, Levi and Simeon go through the camp and they kill every single thing that moves. They hamstrung the oxes. They killed women. They took loot for everything. They went way overboard. They didn't just kill Shechem. They killed everything that moved. And Jacob was abhorrent with how they had been treated. It's noble that they were trying to defend their sister, but what they went to was, was evil. And Jacob, let's go down to the verse, Genesis Jacob says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger, and they've hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't include that. This is just me. And they're cursed. Cursed be their anger and fierce fury. I will scatter them in Jacob. Let's go back to the map. Simeon ceased to exist. Simeon was totally absorbed into Judah, and, and this was before any of the Assyrians and Babylonians came in. There was a subset of Simeonites that moved over to the east side. And so do you remember when the 10 tribes were separated from the two tribes? So Solomon had a son named Rehoboam. When Solomon, Solomon had diverted off, he had chased too many women, fall, fall, false gods, and God told him, I'm going to split your kingdom. Rehoboam is his son. Solomon dies. Rehoboam wants to assert his authority over the northern tribes. He goes to the northern tribes, and by the but Simeon is on the east side, and the east side now is all counted. The two and a half tribes on the east are counted as the northern tribes. So the only two tribes in the south are Judah and Benjamin. And so what happens, Rehoboam goes to his counterpart named Jeroboam, and he says, I want you to be subject to me. And Jeroboam says, well, hold on. Your father put way too much of a tax burden on us. So if you'll release the tax burden on us and the forced labor, then we'll be willing to be in your kingdom. He goes, Rehoboam goes back to the wise council of his father's wise men, and they're like, this is a good deal. You really should relinquish a little bit of this tax burden. And then he goes to his friends, and his friends say, no, 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 don't do that. Those old men don't know what they're talking about. No, you go to them, and you say, my pinky is thicker than my father's thighs, and then you just crush them. Jeroboam's people rise up. And they attack, and Rehoboam never gets it. So there's a split kingdom. There's 10 tribes in the north. Simeon is on the right, is on the eastern side, and two tribes in the south. Eventually, those 10 tribes will be wiped out by the Assyrians. And we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, let's, let's go to the inheritances, the next inheritances. All right, once again, we're skipping all of this. <clears throat> I want you to look at 
first of all, see um, Zebulun and Naphtali. You find those names up there? Zebulun and Naphtali. So let's go to the map. Okay. Up beside, you see the Sea of Galilee? I've lost my map. Up beside the Sea of Galilee, you'll see Zebulun and Naphtali. They are written about in, in Isaiah, in one of the most famous ver chapters of Isaiah. Let me read this. I didn't include it. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who had walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on light, on them light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And so what happened, it's talking about being cursed. As those 10 tribes fell and the Assyrians came through, every time the Assyrians would come through, they would leave Gentiles in this land. And by the time of Christ, people looked at this land, these two tribes, these two tribes didn't exist, but in their land, people looked at it and they called it Galilee of the Gentiles. And they People in Jerusalem looked at this area with disdain. That's why they said, can anything good come from Nazareth, referring to Christ? They looked down on this land because it was the land of the Gentiles. But Christ worked to save everyone in this part of the land. Now, let's go back up. Yes, Scott. That's awesome. For those in Zoom land, so um, Scott has said that uh, Simeon was almost a cursed name for the Israelites because of the Jacob's curse. But yet when Christ was brought to the temple, that one of the first people that saw him was Simeon. And that Simeon had, God had promised him that he wouldn't pass away until he saw the Messiah. And so it's a great story of that name. <coughs> Paul is of the tribe of Benjamin. Yes, Paul is of, of Benjamin. Um, let's go back to the, deeds perfect and we see issachar now let's go to the map and find out where issachar is so issachar is kind of up there in north central everybody see it i can't see it it's red, uh, it's red. okay perfect issachar do you remember in exodus so as they had left mount sinai moses father-in-law moses is all day he's holding court He's making decisions. People are bringing their grievances. And his father-in-law comes to visit. And he says, Moses, what are you doing? And Moses, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you have elders. You have people. You're not supposed to be doing this all by yourself. And so appoint 70 people so that they can hear, they can hear the complaints of these people. And so he appoints 70 elders. The 70 elders are the forerunner of the Sanhedrin. And so the Sanhedrin was always overwhelmingly comprised of people from Issachar. Issachar, um, those people were regarded as scholars. And so in addition to Levites, you have the Sanhedrin being composed of, of Issachar. Now let's look at Asher. Do you see Asher? Asher is up in the north. And so the promise of Asher, this was uh, Asher means happy. He was Zilpah. He was the handmaiden of uh, Leah's, the eight. And uh, Leah called him happy because he was the eighth son. And everyone would know that she's happy now that she's had eight sons more than Rachel. And it said that food will be rich and his gates will be made of iron and bronze. He'll be favored by his brothers and they will wash his feet with oil. And he was apportioned this piece of land, which is the richest piece of land that he could have had on the coastal plains. It was very fertile. And they were very strong. And then Dan, you see Dan, Dan down by Philistine, Philistine, Philistia. And so Dan, 
didn't like this territory. Dan struggled more so than anyone with idols. And they decided, okay, we don't like this. So they went up north of Israel and they attacked and killed the peaceful people and took over their land. And so they were always cursed. I, I believe it has something to do with being right beside where Goliath was going to be. So anyway, so let's go to Joshua 1949. When they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked, Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, and he rebuilt the city and settled in it. These are the inheritances that Ele Eleazar the priest and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the people of Israel distributed by lot at Shiloh before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they finished dividing the land. So Joshua took his land among Ephraim because that is his tribe and he wanted his land to be uh, consistent in keeping with the tribe, the tribal allotments. And he asked for land. He asked specifically, it says, for this land in the hill country where there still would have been giants. And so he's like Caleb. He's still willing. I don't, he had to have been 85 as well. He's still willing to go fight the giants that are in his territory. And Eleazar, the priest of the tribe of Levi, also also had a place along with um, with Joshua, and it says, and so they finish dividing up the land. Overwhelming message in this is that we are supposed to claim what God envisions for us. And I've seen so many times in um, my career people that want a promotion, that want want a position, that want a title, and you know, it's it's not up to someone to give you that. Um, and I mean that in Christianity, I mean that in secular society, you're not supposed to just be given something just because you say I'm special and I'm blessed. We are supposed to go earn it and take it. And we'll never know what God has promised in our secular lives and our Christian lives until we're willing to kill to kill the giants, to get those things that are in the way of God, and to claim what God has given us. All right. It's kickoff time, so you can look at, you can stream on your phone. Any, uh, did the Christmas thing get around? Okay. Did um, anybody have any questions or comments, thoughts? Well, that, that is, Timnasera is the land that was allotted to Joshua. That was his actual, that was his town, that was his allotment in the hill country. What's that? In the West Bank, absolutely. The, the modern day map on the right includes the West Bank, which is occupied by Palestinians, that the Palestinians, along with the Gaza Strip, are hoping someday for the for the two-state solution that as of right now appears highly unlikely. All right, any other? Yes. So Doug asked, um, intermittently the tribes are referred to the half tribe of Manasseh or the tribe of Manasseh or the, or the tribes of Joseph and uh, are there circumstances that call for that? And I'll tell you, I don't think so. And the same thing occurs throughout scripture with the 12 tribes. So there's because of the two tribes of Joseph, there's 13 tribes. And throughout scripture, you'll find listings of the 12 tribes, and it's different. They'll be different. Sometimes it includes one of the tribes of Joseph. Sometimes it includes just Joseph and Levi. It's just different. The Bible is not, many of like the lineages are in Hebrew and in Greek. They're not focused on making sure everything is accurate. They're telling a story that does not have to have the detail, detail, exact figures and names. All right. All right. Thank you, Russell. I'm glad you get the easy. All right. Let's go, Lord, and share these with him. Dear Heavenly Father, we do just lift these prayer requests that, uh, that you know of, you hear, you feel. 
you prepare us for, you, you rejoice with us on many of those, uh, you weep with us on many of those, and uh, we just thank you for this relationship that we have for you, that we will, we will draw on that, draw on the strength that you do give us uh, through that personal relationship with you. We love you. We thank you. We pray that we will continue to reach out to those around us uh, and make a difference this holiday season. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, y'all have a great week.